that sound. Usually, you can hear a mosquito long before you spot it. And while not all mosquitoes are bad, think back to the episode we did about chocolate and how they pollinate cocoa trees. Some, however, are the deadliest animals alive. On this episode of the Oxford Sparks Big Questions podcast, we are looking at malaria and we are asking, how do you monitor mosquitoes using their sound? Hello, I'm Emily Elias, and this is a show where we seek out the brightest minds at the University of Oxford and we ask them the big questions. And for this one, we found a researcher ready to use her smartphone for the greater good. My name is Marianne Schinker. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford. And I am the senior researcher on Humbug, which is a project where we are trying to use the wing beat or the sound, the flight tone of mosquitoes to identify them and to be able to work out where they are to be able to count them. And this is to help our work in monitoring the mosquito vectors of malaria. Why is it important to know which mosquito is out there and being able to identify them? Many people don't actually realise that there's more than one mosquito, but there are actually over 3,500 species of mosquito. Of those, there is only one genus that is able to transmit human malaria, but there's still over 480 species of those. Within those, there are about 75 that can transmit malaria. There is about 40 that are really good at transmitting malaria, particularly dangerous. But even amongst those 40, there's different behaviours that can affect how well they transmit malaria. In Africa, for example, there is one species, Anopheles gambi, which is what people may have heard of as being described as the most dangerous animal in the world. This mosquito is particularly good at transmitting malaria, whereas there are other mosquitoes that are able to transmit malaria in the same locations, but they may not be quite as efficient. And different mosquitoes have different behaviours, and that means that we need to target how we control them in different ways to make it most effective. How are mosquitoes currently being monitored? What is considered to be the gold standard is the one that most people find uh, most interesting or most shocking. Um, The best way to understand what mosquitoes are coming to bite humans and therefore spreading disease to humans is to essentially pull up a stool, sit down, roll up your trousers and wait to see what bites you. And we have vector experts who spend their time doing this. They go out at 6pm and they sit there for 12 hours waiting to see what bites them using torches and trying to basically pick off the mosquito before it actually does manage to bite them. Um, And this is called human landing catch. And this is, you know, as I said, the gold standard. Obviously, there are a lot of ethical issues with this. So it's great, but very problematic. Yeah, it's kind of wild. So obviously, you're coming at this from a different angle to try and tackle the malaria problem. What's your big idea of using sound? Uh, Mosquitoes are are very unique in the way they fly. They have a very, what's kind of called a truncated wing beat. So their wings kind of stutter and that makes a very unique sound. So most people would be able to recognise the sound of a mosquito. So if you're going to bed and you suddenly hear that whine, that very specific whine, you know it's a mosquito, it's not a moth or anything else. So that very specific sound um, allows us to identify mosquitoes from other insects. But more interestingly, different mosquito species sound different because the flight tone or that wind that they make depends upon the size of the mosquito, depends upon how they move their wings and depends on the morphology of the wings, um, as well as other factors. For example, the sex of the mosquito. You know, a male mosquito has a much higher sound than a female mosquito of the same species. So there are lots of influences that can impact on how that mosquito sounds when it flies. And we can try and detect those differences and try and identify the species and also to ha- try to count them. Okay, so you actually have two audio examples that we're going to take a listen to. So, uh, Mosquito A, can you tell me what is Mosquito A? So, Mosquito A is Mansoni africanus. It's a a large mosquito, so it has quite a a loud and low flight tone. That's Mosquito A. Who is Mosquito B? Mosquito B is Anopheles arabiensis. 
Now, Onofli's Arab Arabiensis is um, a sister to Onofli's Gambi. Um, it's so it's a very good vector, but it's not quite as good as Anopheles Gambi, and it has very different behaviour to Anopheles Gambi, um, which means that if you were to find Anopheles Arabiensis, you would do a different kind of control than you would if you find Anopheles Gambi. You can hear the subtle difference in them, but I mean, this is obviously audio that you guys maybe have taken in a lab, have worked with. How do you actually do this in the field and be able to detect between the two in a really sort of noisy environment where lots of things are happening. So at the moment, the way we're doing it is we've developed a method to capture the sound of the mosquito as it comes into someone's house, as it comes into someone's bedroom and as it tries to bite them. The limitations that we have are that because mosquitoes are very small insects, to be able to record them well, they need to come within about 10 centimetres ish, depending on the amount of background noise to the microphone so that we can get a good sound recording. Now, on the majority of the mosquitoes that transmit human malaria tend to bite at night because they're adapted to bite when people are asleep and therefore vulnerable. They're not going to slap those mosquitoes away. And that's why bed nets work very well. So what we've done is we've adapted a bed net and placed a smartphone that's running an app called the Mosware app in that so that when the mosquito comes to try and bite the person sleeping under the bed net, they fly near our smartphone and we can capture the sound. And then we take that sound, it gets uploaded to the servers with our colleagues in the Department of Engineering. And those guys have developed some fantastic algorithms that can then detect the mosquito from the background noise. So we run the the audio through the algorithms and it's able to pull out the sound of the mosquito from that background. How long did it take you guys to be able to even put all of these different working parts together from identifying the mosquito to creating an algorithm that would tell it apart to then creating a, something, an app that would go onto a smartphone that people could put in their rooms? We've been working on this now for about seven years. Uh, the app development was part of the Google Impact Challenge. That was the first three years of the project. And then in more recent years, we've been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this has allowed us to go out and actually collect wild mosquitoes and record them. Um, We have some collaborators in Tanzania at the Ifakara Health Institute and um, also in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Kinshasa School of Public Health and the University of Bundundu. And those guys go out and collect mosquitoes carefully so we make sure that the wings are not damaged take them back to the lab record them and that's allowed us to build up a database of over 8,000 mosquitoes that we could then identify to species that has then gone to train the algorithms Um, in the meantime we've developed this uh, methodology to collect the mosquitoes in the bed nets so the whole thing has kind of come together and has been like a lot of moving parts but overall about seven years to get to this particular point where we are now field testing the system and about field testing i mean this is a big ask to put a microphone into somebody's bedroom how have people responded to that request it's actually quite a lot of people have alexas in their bedroom so it's something that the people are getting used to but In the areas where we have been working, so for example, um, in Ifakara, our colleagues in the Ifakara Health Institute have gone out and they've spoken to people in the community and asked them, is it okay that we do this? Because obviously you have to make sure everyone is happy. And we've had some fantastic responses from people, people who have just said, we just really want to be involved in something that that might help. And these these guys are, you know, they suffer, malaria is a big deal. Uh, has estimated that in 2020 there were over 241 million cases. That's just in that year, 2020. Um, there were 627,000 deaths. Um, and you just get a lot of really positive, helpful people who are willing to just... Uh, and they run the system for us. We give them the phones and we ask them, can you put this in your bed net? Can you turn this on? Can you press this button to upload the data for us? So they're heavily involved and happy to do so. We'd be running... Um, a community study in there just to actually make sure that people are happy and just to see how well it all works and so far the results have been absolutely fantastic and the community is absolutely brilliant we we couldn't be happier with them and because it's on a smartphone app and everybody seems to have a smartphone these days i mean how game-changing could this be for the amount of data that you get in i mean it could be huge i mean at the moment uh in the rural communities that uh, are suffering most from malaria 
smartphone usage isn't or ownership isn't that great, but we use budget smartphones that we buy locally and we can distribute those. But in the end, we hope that anyone who has a smartphone should be able to download these apps and with a with simple instructions should be able to set them up and start generating and uploading data. I mean, it could be game changing, we hope, obviously, um, but just to be able to see uh, long term data, for example, see the seasonal fluctuations to be able to see very interestingly. So when people go out and try a new method to control the mosquitoes, Sometimes it works, sometimes it works for a period of time, and then sometimes it's, it stops working. But it would allow us to really pinpoint the time when an intervention stops working. Suddenly the number of mosquitoes would increase. And if we have lots of long-term monitoring, lots of people putting smartphones in, in their beds or around their houses, and just listening and monitoring and letting us know, that would be a fantastic red flag and let people know something's not going wrong here, we need to go in and we need to work out what's, what, what the problem is. What does it mean for you as a researcher to be working on this specific project and have such success? It's really good. I've been working or researching into malaria mosquitoes for about 15 years. And um, and this project, if we can get it to work, it means that we will be able to massively increase the amount of data that we have. And this will massively increase our ability to target these mosquitoes appropriately and to really make a difference in the way that malaria is affecting people. This podcast was brought to you by Oxford Sparks from the University of Oxford with music by John Lyons and a special thanks to Marianne Shinka and the entire Humbug team. Tell us what you think about this podcast. You can rate and review us on whatever podcasting app that you happen to be using. And we're also on the internet at Oxford Sparks. Check out our website as well, oxfordsparks.ox.ac.uk. I'm Emily Elias. Bye for now. Bye for now.